Hello, I'm Mark Ells, Town Manager in Barnstable, and this is the Town Manager's Update for February 3rd through February 16th. We're modifying the Town Manager communication that is normally done during Town Council meetings, and that'll be announced by the President of the Town Council during the Town Council meeting uh, later today. Uh, but basically, we're going to pre-record the Town Manager's communication uh, so that uh, both you can view it and have access to it. We'll still be posting the written town manager report, and uh, it'll give the town council more time to get into the orders of the day. So thank you in your patience as we move forward with this change. We're proceeding with the budget action calendar for FY 2024 as scheduled. The capital budget for FY24 and capital plan for FY24 through FY28 are scheduled to be submitted to the Town Council on March 6, 2023. Public hearings on the capital improvement orders are scheduled to begin on April 27, 2023. We have a scheduled workshop with Town Council on April 6. To continue the discussion regarding revenue sources to address the capital costs of implementing our comprehensive wastewater management plan, including the recommendation uh, to uh, proceed with a debt exclusion vote. For information on our fiscal year budget, please go to the town's website. On February 15, 2023, municipal leaders from Cape Cod had an opportunity to communicate with the Lieutenant Governor on the proposed regulatory changes to Title V and watershed permits and the need for additional funding to support the cost of compliance with the Clean Water Act and proceeding with our comprehensive wastewater management plans. We anticipate that the Lieutenant Governor will coordinate a meeting with Cape Cod communities and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection to further discuss these concerns as MassDEP proceeds with its approval of these regulations. Just a side note, we do anticipate DEP proceeding with these. We have encouraged our public to, to look into these, um, to become familiar with them. This is a significant regulatory change. Our discussions were really to make sure that in the event of this change, that our existing approved comprehensive wastewater management plans can continue to proceed as we have been implementing them. This is required for us to, um, to, to, to remain compliant with the Clean Water Act, to reduce nitrogen loading, to meet our total maximum daily loads of nitrogen into our bays. I think our public knows that we have uh, water concerns uh, in our coastal embayments, and it's important that these efforts continue to proceed. So we'll keep you advised as these discussions continue, but the primary discussions were about, you know, how the regulations will be approved and hopefully the ability to access additional funding in support of implementation of our comprehensive wastewater management plan. Great Streets Hyannis, uh, entitled A Walkable Heart for Cape Cod. Um, is re-envisioning how Hyannis Main Street and the surrounding streets and intersections are designed and function. Town of Barnstable, together with project partner Jeff Speck and Stantec Consulting, invite the community to view and comment on conceptual designs for two-way streets and reconfiguration of intersections on our project uh, webpage. Uh, the public is invited and encouraged to comment on the plan, which includes conceptual street crossing sections, large-scale intersection redesigns, additional on-street parking options, and an on-street protected bicycle network. As discussed at the community meeting back on January 25th, the conversation of the traffic network to two ways and additional bike lanes can be accomplished in the near term by restriping the pavement. 
modifying traffic controls, and other short-term interventions. Intersection reconstructions are envisioned as a longer-term investment to achieve greater walkability traffic management, safety for all users, and enhancements to the downtown. So um, we're taking comments through March 19th, so please to go to our website and um, view that and comment. We encourage your participation. Our local comprehensive plan uh, in the town of Barnstable is proceeding and they invite the community to attend an upcoming uh, bring it together workshop to reflect on community values and establish a community vision. Key themes of public input collected over the last five months will be presented as well as trends related to topics including housing, economy, transportation, open space, and equity. There will be two community visioning workshops uh, a virtual workshop on Tuesday, February 28th between noon and 1.15 p.m. And an in-person workshop Wednesday, March 1st between 5 and 7 p.m. Pizza will be provided at the in-person workshop and in, in partnership with Barnstable Recreation. Um, arts and crafts and a movie will be available for children ages kindergarten through fifth grade if you choose to bring them along. The content and structure of the two workshops will be the same with the exception of one extra exercise at the end of the in-person workshop. Um, for planning purposes, we kindly ask that all attendees pre-register. The Recreation Division is currently processing 2023 beach parking permits. We encourage the public to apply now and have their beach sticker in hand by Memorial Day when processing times will take significantly longer due to the increased volume of permit applications. Parking permits may be obtained by accessing our online system by mail or Dropbox located at the Hyannis Youth and Community Center. Permits are no longer being issued in person. Applications can be picked up at the Hyannis Youth and Community Center and the Barnstable Adult Community Center. The online system has a user guide to help those who are new to the process. And for anybody with specific questions or in need of additional assistance with the online system, you can call us at 508-790-6345 at extension 145, and a Recreation Division staff member will follow up with you to ensure you are able to secure your permit in time for summer. That concludes my town manager's update. Uh, and now we'll have um, Kelly Colpe, our communications manager for the Public Works Department, provide an update on water resource management planning, including the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan. Kelly? Thank you. So today I want to speak a little bit about the water resources management plans that we have in progress right now. The first, of course, major project being the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan. Now, since it's been a little while since we've provided an update, I wanted to really start with an overview of some of the key milestones that we've achieved. We are currently in phase one. So for those who are familiar with the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan, you would know that this is a 30-year plan comprised of three 10-year phases. Being in phase one, we're actually in year two of the first 10 years. During that first 10 year plan, that first 10 year phase, we have two active construction projects. One being the Strawberry Hill Road project, which we'll touch upon, as well as the Route 28 East project. Both are nearing completion and we'll break down a little bit in more detail um, what work has been progressed in both of those construction projects. One thing I think is important to share is the nitrogen issue. In these two current construction projects, again, just the first two of 16 proposed projects in phase one, roughly 8% of the total nitrogen will be addressed in, those, in, those, in the completion of those construction projects. So although that's a very small number, it's actually big progress. 53% of the phase one projects are in active design or construction. And we'll talk about what that means as we progress through the slides. And then most importantly, looking at the water. In the current phase one projects that we have in construction, again, Strawberry Hill and Route 28 East, the Centerville River watershed, it is 
is what is the primary focus of treatment is. So looking at our first active construction project, the Strawberry Hill Road project. Many of you are likely familiar with this as you're seeing the majority of our traffic management being focused on this area, specifically Finney's Lane. Currently we have two construction crews on site for our contractor, one being the sewer main installation crew. This is really the heart of the system installing what we call the trunk lines that are gonna power the rest of the sewer expansion project. That team is advancing north of Old Strawberry Hill Road. Additionally, we have the sewer lateral installation crew, what we call the service crew, and they're currently north of Huckins Neck Road and are providing services to parcels along that route. And that will be for your further connection um, for those homes for, for further connection to the municipal sewer system. Right now, this Strawberry Hill Road project is 80% 80 com 80 complete. So we truly are you know, approaching that light at the end of the tunnel with this work here for Strawberry Hill Road. The second project that's in active construction right now is our Route 20 East project. This includes the Finney's Lane pump station. Sewer installation is progressing along the southern portion of Finney's Lane, currently right now proceeding from uh, Great Marsh Road toward Pond Street. Construction is anticipated in Route 28 sometime in late March. And of course, as that construction, those construction schedules firm up and you know, we see that progress um, making way, we'll have additional outreach for the community in that area. We also have the Finney's Lane pump station, which I mentioned. We have concrete work that's been poured for the foundation as well as influent channel walls. A lot of that's very technical, but we'll take a look at the next slide so you can actually see what that looks like. But in its essence, this project is about 15% complete. What I think is important to note here is why such the drastic difference in, in completion versus Strawberry Hill Road. There's some very deep sewer excavation happening right now. If you live in the area like I do, and you drive past Great Marsh Road frequently or have been around some of those closures and detours, you'll see that crew is moving a little bit slower. And that's simply because of the depth of excavation. As the crew continues to advance farther north, closer to Pond Street, we'll see that excavation and that installation actually progress, and that number will start to creep up just like the Strawberry Hill completion number. So here's the fun stuff. Let's take a look at where the pump station on Finney's Lane is currently. So this picture really gives you a sort of bird's eye view looking just how deep, how many layers we really are going down. Um, there's quite a bit of work that's been done if you've seen any of the active construction in that area, you will know they are very busy uh, working very hard on getting that pump station complete. It was a very large hole and now they're doing all of the work they need to to continue that foundation work and the effluent channel walls. Next we have the Park City Wind Project or what I would like to refer to as the sewer expansion along the Park City proposed Park City, City Wind route. This project is currently in design, the sewer expansion aspect. We're coordinating very closely with the Park City Wind staff, and we continue to coordinate with the town's legal team regarding pump station, the pump station, proposed pump station at Mothers Park Road, and associated intersection improvements. We are planning an informational meeting to be held in early March at the Centerville Public Library, where we'll discuss these projects and the proposed um, designs in more detail. Sewer project, the sewer project itself is anticipated to include six sewer pump stations, including that which we just noted at the Mothers Park Road. Land acquisition will be anticipated, uh, is anticipated to be necessary for approximately one to three of those pump station sites. And in its essence, right now, the sewer expansion design for Park City Wind is about 25% complete. Next, we have the Route 28 West project. This is really just scratching the surface right here. The design contract has been awarded to Weston Sampson and we have survey work in progress. So if you've noted, as I've been going through these slides, we've been highlighting the various projects that are actively either in construction or design. So I'd love for you to just keep an eye on as we continue to build. And then ultimately when we get to the last project update, you'll see the entire breadth of what we're touching right now in phase one. And this is where it gets really interesting. Here are our neighborhood projects. Currently in design and survey are the Finney's Lane neighborhood project, both neighborhoods on the east and west side of Finney's Lane, as well as Old Craigville Road, Old Yarmouth Road, and Shoot Fine Hill Road neighborhood projects, and the Long Pond Road project. Finney's Lane is 
probably the most active at the, at the moment in terms of um, design and survey. And what we'll be talking about on the next slide are the water and sewer easement takings that we will be presenting to town council. So as you can see right here on this slide, we have got every active project right now, whether it's in design or construction highlighted. And that equates to um, nine out of the 16 proposed projects in phase one, or as I noted on the first slide, 53% of the projects that will be completed in phase one. So it really speaks to the testament, the dedication of the town to protect and heal our water resources by being so active in pushing these projects forward. So as I noted earlier, private road utility easements. This is gonna be particularly important as we progress through construction on these neighborhood projects. The first seven private road takings will be presented at this evening's town council meeting. So what does that mean to you? In order to secure financing and ultimately construct sewer within private roads, it is necessary that the town take sewer and water utility easements over the roadway. And what that really means is that that easement grants the town unobstructed access to install, operate, and maintain the proposed utilities within that private roadway, ultimately your municipal sewer access. This does not change the status of the road. Private roads will remain private. However, it does grant us the access to work in that roadway. What we did to help communicate to the public um, these private road utility easements was perform direct mail outreach to all the identified property owners in these first seven private roads that we're presenting to town council. And so far we've received very positive feedback. Most projects moving forward will include private roads and ultimately will require the need for these, these sewer and water utility easements. So our next steps truly are as construction proceeds and currently for the Finney's Lane neighborhood project, we're looking at um, late 2025, we'll provide further communication to the residents of those private roads and also the surrounding, the surrounding roads, giving them sort of you know, expectations of what to look for as construction moves forward, what will be needed for th on their end, um, their responsibilities as a property owner, similarly to how we have handled outreach for the Strawberry Hill Road and um, Route 28 East projects. We are also expected to come before town council approximately every other month with these easement requests as project design and construction evolves. Water pollution control facility projects. All are still in progress. Currently right now we've had some movement with the nitrogen removal and headworks improvement. The design RFP has been issued and responses are due in about two weeks on March 3rd. Construction is anticipated to commence in fiscal year 2025, so likely late, late 2025. Effluent disposal evaluation, there are um, con refined modeling evaluation um, happening right now with CDM Smith. And then the solids processing facility upgrades, construction is ongoing, so that is still happening and in progress and is scheduled to be completed before the end of this calendar year. And then we also have the, the study ongoing at the Water Pollution Control Facility Engineering Facility. And we will update with um, results as soon as we can. One thing I'd love to touch about, which is near and dear to my heart, is the communications behind the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan. We are really excited to announce that we have a Ways for Cities partnership. And what that means is that we now can control real-time traffic management updates within the Waze platform. Waze does speak with Google as well, so there's some great synergy there. How we've been employing this, we have been able to reopen and also close roads in real time, making those who use Waze, making that a much more efficient experience for you. So rather than just having road closure set from seven to five, if a road opens up early, for example, which we've been seeing from time to time, we're able to actually open that up in the Waze platform and then ultimately show you the most accurate road closures and openings. And as I mentioned, integrating with Google Maps is very helpful for those who are more comfortable with that app. Um, again, successful early reopening of closures and extension of closures when needed as well. So this again provides the most accurate information to folks as you're experiencing that rush hour commute, whether it's in the morning on your way to work or on your way home. Additionally, we've been able to include Vineyard Winds construction activities as well. So this is really giving you a complete comprehensive look at all road closures across all projects. 
One thing I'd like to note is that the Waze platform, as well as Google, does not show one-way alternating or single lane closures. It's truly just a full road closure. So as you're navigating traffic, really lean on the flaggers and the police details. We have had immense support from Barnstable Police Department, and we work very closely with both police, fire, the school bus system, and Barnstable Public Schools, as well as the Postal Service and other key stakeholders to ensure that the traffic management plans that we are putting out there and ultimately communicating through Waze and Barnstable E-News are as accurate as possible. And not just accurate, but that they work for our residents in keeping you safe while also maintaining the integrity of the construction sites. Our next steps will be to embed that Waze Live map directly on the Barnstable Water Resources website. So giving you sort of a one-stop shop to get all of your construction updates, project news, and also traffic management. And then also looking to leverage Waze for Cities data to make more relevant traffic and infrastructure decisions, as well as developing use cases for how you can support um, crisis and natural, such as natural disasters or severe weather, how we can support our communications through Waze as well. There's some really unique features that we'll be playing around with and experimenting with and, and be sure to share with you. I'd also like to touch on some existing sewer infrastructure improvements, as this also is related to our water quality um, and resource management. Last night, we held a public information meeting for the 720 Main Street Pump Station Replacement Project. So the existing 720 Main Street Pump Station does not have the capacity to handle peak design flows and is in the final stage of its intended, intended design life. Additionally, we also have um, capacity limitations, we're approaching capacity for the sewers on South Street. And if unaddressed, this would actually restrict growth within the downtown Hyannis growth incentive zone. Infrastructure improvement includes construction of a new replacement pump station located on the town-owned property at 725 Main Street. The project it listed is listed on the 2022 SRF intended use plan and has also been approved by the Conservation Commission. You know, we are anticipating, you know, as, as, as long as everything continues to, to progress the way it has, that construction will, will start in fall of 2023. As I noted, we had a public presentation last night that included an overview of the, the current site and the current infrastructure at 720 Main Street, the proposed designs for 725 Main Street, as well as an opportunity for the public to ask questions and provide feedback. We are collecting public feedback through Friday, March 3rd, and you can actually send that directly to me at kelly.colopy at town.barnstable.ma.us. And this is just a rendering of what the proposed design for that 725 Main Street pump station would look like. I highly encourage that you go visit the Town of Barnstable website and navigate over to the DPW project page where you can find the full presentation last night, which includes additional renderings. Lastly, I just wanted to touch on the Vineyard Wind Project, specifically because the duct bank installation does follow our sewer expansion route. Next week, we have significant activity that will be happening on Route 28, specifically in the intersection of Route 28 and Strawberry Hill Road. A portion of this duct bank installation work will require a detour around the construction zone. We're preparing final communications and we'll be posting um, official detours and road closures as needed. So again, I highly encourage you to, if you have not yet, uh, subscribe to Barnstable E-News, um, as well as utilize all of the wonderful channels that we have for information sharing, such as the town Facebook page and Barnstable Water Resources, where we will where we will, will be sharing all of them, the related detours and traffic management surrounding this project. In addition to the duck bank installation, construction continues at the Colville's Beach parking lot as well as some tech testing and electrical cable pulling along Vineyard Winds project route. Additionally, they also completed their second offshore shore cable pull, so making some really great progress there. And what I know everyone's probably most excited about is the, the final paving schedule for disturbed roadways. We are anticipating final paving for Attics Lane, the top coast course of Craigville Beach Road. As many of you know, there is that intermediate layer to hold us through um, winter weather but the top course for Craigville Beach Road and Strawberry Hill Road are all anticipated to be paved curb to curb this spring. And then following in the fall, Finney's Lane and Waquocket Lane. So we'll have some beautiful new roadways with new paving very shortly. 
And that is our water resource update. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, again, Mark Ells, town manager. Finally, uh, the superintendent of Barnesville Public Schools, Sarah Hearn, shared a draft of her presentation to the school committee on the superintendent's report on entry fi fi findings. Um, that presentation will follow my town manager communication. So we're going to actually provide a link and you're, you will be able to view this um, after the town manager communication. It'll be the actual presentation by the superintendent at the school committee. We feel that this is very important. I meet with the superintendent uh, weekly, uh, certainly to discuss any and all topics relevant to providing public education in Barnstable and the involvement of, of our municipal staff with our school staff. And we assure you that um, the efforts of our school superintendent uh, to identify uh, the strengths of our schools and to work with me to continue to move toward, um, you know, the, the, the best education, public education that our, our schools can provide is a priority for us. And therefore, from time to time, we will share those presentations with you. Um, and that concludes my town manager communication. Thank you. So I have a... Um a PowerPoint to share with you, and I do so with great humility. Uh, I'm the newcomer here. I've been officially on the job for seven months. Um, so this is presented as a draft to reflect back to you the things that I'm learning about and hearing uh, from members of the community. Um, I am looking for feedback from you uh, and from others to see if what I've identified I've gotten right. I feel like I'm on the right track uh, because I don't know that there will be much of any surprises here. I feel like you as a committee in engaging for a superintendent search, uh, just by the nature of the questions that you asked, uh, you know your community uh, and you knew and know the challenges and the opportunities that exist here, so as well as the strengths. So I don't think that there will be many surprises, but I am uh, looking forward to sharing with you all that I've learned and what I've been um, working on and, um, and look, for, uh, look for your input. Um, so as you know, I started a transition plan back in February, uh, met with uh, many of you at that time, and began the process of meeting with those closest to the superintendent's office, and then officially launched an entry in July, uh, specifically looking for data that I could hear from people, meeting with community members in the district, uh, what could I read about, uh, including data and documentation, and making observations in classroom schools and community spaces, all around an essential question of what are the strengths and opportunities here in Barnstable. I may have missed a few things along the way, but I've tried to catalog some of my activities in terms of who I've been listening to and meeting with, whether individually or in groups. Um, so um, within the schools, uh, talking with youth school committee members and meeting with administrators. I met with the faculty and staff of each building through um, voluntary faculty meetings, and I conducted a survey back in November that 355 people returned. Um, I convened uh, and have, had an opportunity to meet with faculty and staff members of color um, who um, shared their specific perspective, which uh, I think is important to note. Uh, I've been meeting with union leadership um, and rekindling uh, relationships there uh, for monthly meetings. Um, True Delight was meeting students, um, having met with uh, focus groups for pizza at BUES and BIS. Um, those uh, groups were selected by counselors and the principal and assistant principals uh, specifically to broadly represent the diversity of the student body. And at BHS, I met with six different groups of students. Um, I met with the Gender and Sexuality Alliance. I met with a group of eighth, ninth, and 10th graders. I met with 11th and 12th graders. I met with the top 5% of the senior class. I met with students who are multilingual learners, and I met with students who identify as black, indigenous, or a person of color um, to have specific focus group conversations. All in all, I met with about 80 students, and the high school students either enjoyed breakfast or sandwiches. Um, I just noticed um, that, uh, that uh, or as I just mentioned uh, with um, chairperson judge's question, I met with families in recent weeks. Um, about 70 people had signed up, although a few folks didn't show. And I attended a CPAC and a new, um, a new organization that um, Karina De Silva, our EL director, has started an LPAC, which is a parent advisory council for our English learner families. 
I've also been meeting with people in the community, um, including the town manager and assistant town manager, as well as some town department staff. Um, invited elected officials to meet, including members of the town council, and I met with several um, of our elected representatives here on um, the Cape and Islands. Um, I met with the police chief and officers from our SRO unit. Um, I met with four of the five fire chiefs um, within town. I had a fifth meeting, but he was called away to an emergency. Um, met with regional emergency management personnel. I met with and took a tour of Cape Cod Regional Technical High School. I met with Bob Sanborn there, and I also met with the executive director and took a tour of, Char of Sturgis. Ooh, have to orient my east. Um, <laughs> and worry myself with the geographically, but I took a tour of Sturgis East. Um, I've been getting to know uh, the regional superintendents and the Cape Cod collaborative officials, um, also having taken a tour uh, at the uh, school um, within Barnstable uh, that, they, that they have over at Bums River Road. Uh, I've met with a few Cape Cod community college officials, um, several representatives from local mental health agencies. I attended a business improvement district breakfast uh, and had a couple follow-up meetings with individuals from that, and I've gotten to know some of the representatives from Barnstable No Place for Hate. Um, there may be more, and I'm sorry if I've forgotten anybody, but um, the community has been incredibly welcoming and um, eager to share uh, their perspective and identify opportunities with the schools. Um, <clears throat> continuing on, also looking at uh, data and document review, I'm sure there's things that I'm overlooking, um, but um, policies and our procedures and forms, reviewing collective bargaining agreements, um, even participating in some finalization of, of some of those, um, previous budgets, student achievement data, human resources materials, um, presentations uh, and expectations that are relevant to our town finance office, uh, district and school handbooks. Um, I spent the summer really kind of pouring over all of those uh, and gave them a lot of careful attention. Um, the athletic handbooks, any program reviews that we have uh, done recently, including in areas like special education, um, student services and athletics, and the program of studies. Available curriculum materials and report cards, registration materials, uh, school and district improvement plans, publicly available information to the Department of Education, um, our discipline data, as well as our uh, discipline materials and suspension letters, I've kind of randomly gone into uh, standards for success and looked at observation and evaluation materials, um, looked at previous meeting agendas for school committee and leadership team. Um, the principals know that I'm kind of scanning in the background, um, not so much to, to micromanage, but just so I can stay in tune to what's going on across the district, so they share their meeting and professional development agendas with me. Uh, I review school newsletters, um, have taken a look at our websites and social media accounts. I look at newspaper articles and read the Cape Cod Times daily, and um, selected, certainly not all, um, of our vendor contracts. <coughs> In terms of making observations, with the exception of the month of January, um, I've been doing monthly visits to schools with principals, although I do go more frequently as needed, but we have some regular meetings to discuss matters of importance to our classrooms and workspaces. Um, touring the buildings and grounds with both the principals and facilities director. Um, touring specifically with the athletic director of the high school grounds and attendance at selected events as my schedule allows. Um, I'm looking forward to having some open room. Now that some of my evening sessions are done, I'm uh, missing uh, the winter sports season, so I look forward to getting to some of those events as well as some of the things that are coming up like Mary Poppins. Um, these will not end, I will continue to engage. This is in many ways part of my regular practice and how I engage in my work. So the meetings and the document review and data and observations will not, will not end. Um, when I met with the students, I asked all of the groups to share a word with me at the end of our discussion to uh, describe their experience. And uh, I told them that they could repeat the same word and I put it in a Wordle word cloud um, engine. Uh, and this is what your students, our students, are saying about their school experience. The larger the word, the more frequently that word showed up uh, in the conversation as they were sharing their words with me, and the number one word that came up was diversity. The second word was fun. Um, that came more from the younger students that I met with, um, and the other words uh, are representative of what, uh, what the kids were saying. Um, there are some, uh, there's a great variety in these words. 
uh, in, in terms of uh, challenging uh, and complicated. Um, there's also respectful, amazing, and safe. Um, I did include seguro and difficile uh, to recognize um, directly what uh, some of our multilingual learners were saying, uh, seguro meaning safe and difficile meaning difficult. Um, not all experiences are reflected as positive. Um, I noted one student chose racism. Um, and indeed, our conversations, which I conducted with the principals, uncovered some previously unreported bullying. Um, and I assure you that the principal is following up with the appropriate response. So the first part of the question is what are the strengths within uh, the Barnstable Public Schools and uh, what are the opportunities? So first the strengths, and again, these are, this is a draft and so I am open to uh, input from you and uh, others in the community. Uh, but similar to the student saying that the word that encapsulates their experience with diversity, um, multiple, multiple people uh, over the course of the, um, of the conversations that I've had have um, shared their perspective that the greatest strength of our community uh, is the diversity among our students and families. Um, within all of these strengths, there also exist, exist opportunities to strengthen what are our strengths and to capitalize on them. Um, and just as I noted that there were some um, really positive experiences, there are also some positive negative experiences that our students are feeling. Um, and that was also reflected at times by faculty. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important um, that we take steps to make sure that each member of the community feels a sense of belonging. Um, <clears throat> and I think we're doing so. Um, unified sports uh, is one example, um, but other things that people noted um, that would go a long way include things like reducing language barriers um, and um, a real desire for uh, an increased level of family engagement. Um, and I'll talk more about that um, when we get to opportunities. Another area of strength that was noted over and over again is the de dedication of our faculty and staff, which was cited uh, among uh, numerous community groups that I spoke with. Uh, and then uh, data is supportive of that in terms of the educators tending to be very committed to the district. Um, we have people who have spent a lot of time here in their career, they have grown here, they have uh, developed, um, developed throughout their career. And our data is above the state level for retention consistently. And then I have um, personally witnessed and observed um, numerous times that Barnesville educators have rallied around students and families as well as each other. And then third um, is, a, is a true strength, I think, and it's very unique and very specific to Barnstable. And it has to do with our location in the region. It has to do with our size. And my quote is at the bottom, sorry, it's getting a little cut off, which is that the breadth of opportunities afforded to students in Barnstable would be the envy of any school district in the Commonwealth. Um, I really, I think if there's any surprises that I come to see is that, um, is that we may not, um, shout it out enough, we may not celebrate it enough, we may not recognize it enough, um, and really truly coming in with a lens from Off Cape, from Franklin, who was trying to do many of these same things, um, this really would be the envy of any school district in the Commonwealth. And when I talk about that, I'm speaking about things like our enrichment opportunities, um, some of which maybe took a hit during COVID, but I see people bringing back with gusto, um, including the fine and performing arts. Um, SEL, came up um, loud and clear with people being very proud that Barnstable is a SEL leader in the Cape Cod region. Our high school course offerings are um, incredible. Uh, and the ones that I've selected are ones that I haven't seen elsewhere, although there's plenty of creative ones um, that ex don't exist in most schools, um, but fashion, cartooning and animation, understanding diversity, criminal justice, black studies, global issues, entrepreneurship, finance stood out to me. Um, my stepdaughter uh, is a sophomore in college and she picked marketing as her major, but she took her first finance course and said if she had known what finance involved, she would have gone into finance as a major. Uh, she didn't know marketing either. It was kind of a, <laughs> <laughs> she actually started in hospitality. So. <laughs> but I guess my point is that just offering all of these gives students an opportunity to see what they might like or what they might not want to do. 
music technology, hip hop, the influence and trends, coastal ecology, pathology and biotechnology. I just went on and on and on. Um, this is a long presentation, so I won't continue with this list, but if you just open up the program of studies, it's really unbelievable what students have uh, available to them. Uh, in addition, at the high school, the career pathways are truly, uh, truly noteworthy. Um, with students being able to pursue uh, areas of interest and passion um, in the health careers, environmental science, engineering, business, education, culinary, law, society, and criminal justice and computer science. Elsewhere in the district or throughout the entire district, uh, Gateway has come up as a real strength. Uh, I think Barnes Deval ought to be proud for having uh, a gifted and talented program and for having done so for so long in a state that does it mandate it uh, or even really recognize it um, like other states do? Um, recently, uh, we've been having conversations about the ways in which the current director has been expanding access for students to Gateway uh, and reducing barriers uh, and opening up Gateway uh, for more children. But the students um, over and over again um, talked about how Gateway, and I think in, in many similar ways, PBL falls into the same category really supported them, um, it was their passion, it's what they loved, and really um, drew them to and engaged them uh, in, in, in their schooling. Um, the special education services are strong, uh, I think because of our size, we offer uh, a, a, a strong continuum that smaller districts um, would not be able to do. Our, we have two alternative education programs at the high school with uh, ACE and Project Excel, and then a focus of PBL in multiple locations, which we, you heard about directly tonight. In terms of uh, opportunities, we have extensive co-curriculars, extracurriculars and enrichments, including over 50 clubs at Barnstable High School. Uh, our athletics is strong, and um, Andre King talked uh, notably about that tonight uh, and at other points in time. Um, fine arts and performing arts. I think just walking around the high school, you can see the investment in the fine arts with the murals uh, that are on the walls. Um, as one example, uh, the performing arts with the Performing Arts Center and the comeback that is being made by our uh, performance groups. We have middle school opportunities and we are bringing back field trips. And then uh, also I think very unique to Barnstable, uh, a number of examples came up already this evening in terms of community relationships and partnerships. We have um, some very generous uh, and um, devoted local donors, including the Cobb Trust, the Skendi Foundation, Cape Cod Five, among others. Um, we have a lot of partners that sponsor students with high school internships, um, but also at the younger grades, BCIS with the enrichment clusters, relationship with Cape Cod Community College, health service agencies in Barnstable. I, as I had mentioned, the mental health groups had reached out to me. Uh, Parent-teacher organizations supporting students, particularly in the younger schools. Uh, the Town Recreation Department affords students a wealth of opportunities with HYCC in particular, and then a number of community groups uh, that are invested in both schools and the overall well-being of the community. So it really is a remarkable, remarkable place to be. <clears throat> I've identified four areas of opportunity. Again, um, I don't think that they're going to come as a huge surprise, although I welcome your input and feedback. The first one, um, I've lumped a few things in an area around uh, a strong desire and need to come together as a community. Um, people shared uh, sentiments of feeling disconnected. Um, many people I spoke with cited that the two grade span schools, grade four, five, grade six, seven, are, particularly, are particular concerns in terms of continuity. Um, but I would say that the configuration of BUES and BIS is not the only driver of these feelings. Um, people have reflected a sense of loss. I would say tonight we heard how things are making a comeback. Um, so the enrichment clusters this is the first time that they've done them in three years. Um, the field trips, uh, some of the senior events that our student envoys talked about, people are mourning that loss and getting back to some of the events uh, and people have remarked over and over how, um, how they'd like to see more of those, more of that positivity. 
people are reflecting um, feelings of fatigue and stress and uh, trauma-based responses. We've all been through a huge collective trauma with the pandemic. Um, but there's also, I think, individuals who have a lot going on in their lives, students and families and staff alike. And um, we're seeing an escalation of maladaptive behaviors and that's causing stress. Um, we've talked a little bit about that tonight and uh, we'll be spending more time uh, addressing that. I've seen um, some pockets where I think the curriculum um, is discontinuous. They came, this came up in some budget conversations in particular. So um, I think there's an opportunity to create more of a through line uh, in terms of our curriculum. And uh, faculty have uh, reflected wanting to feel like uh, part of a more cohesive whole. Um, heard people remark around um, a desire for more consistent and positive communication. Uh, as well as seeking opportunities for additional clarity. Um, that might be because in places we're working towards more consistency of practice. Um, the pandemic, um, and it, but it might not all be the pandemic, uh, I think really threw everybody's systems uh, up in the air and uh, districts everywhere are putting the pieces back together and maybe coming back together a little differently. Um, but there's also been a lot of turnover. There's been a lot of turnover of leadership and that can create some um, some questions of clarity, questions of expectations. So there's an opportunity there. Um, a need to continue to work toward the sense of belonging. Uh, it's something that has been talked about um, previous to my arrival. Um, but again, I think that there are some, um, some folks saying that, they, uh, that there may be some barriers to kind of feeling that they truly belong. And I think we can work towards those. Um, encouragement to focus on the positive and celebrate successes. Uh, and then I also see an opportunity to create some priorities. Sometimes it feels like there's so much going on and you can go in all sorts of directions. Um, and so to that end, um, both uh, Joe and Andre talked about uh, a vision of a graduate, um, which I have um, also talked a little bit with uh, Mike about. Um, and it's something that I think we can do to bring uh, to initially, there's a lot of work to do, I think, to, to build and foster a, a culture but to work together to, to vision and work towards common goal of what the community um, sees as a consensus of the skills that our students need for their future. And then we align budget, we align our goals, we align um, decision making um, towards, that, towards that vision. And so um, I'm looking forward to that. We talked about it as part of the uh, subcommittee and um, it's tied with the accreditation process at the high school, but the, in my mind, um, that would make it feel far too like a compliance exercise. And I think doing it district wide um, would be really, really meaningful um, for everybody. Um, so in the second area, um, kind of continuing to focus on academics and SEL, and in that SEL realm, I would um, hang sign on behavior, recognizing that we have um, an escalation of maladaptive behaviors in our school buildings. Um, seeing a desire and need to focus on instruction following remote and hybrid learning models. What are some of the best things that we could take away from those periods of time? But what did we also learn about the power of in-person learning, the strength of relationships, the importance of the relationship between the teacher and students and among students? Uh, we know that we have an increased level of skill gaps among students. Um, for me, I feel like that's pretty noticeable, grades four, five, and six, seven. Um, when you go into a classroom and you see um, skill gaps there um, and teachers are working really hard to address them, but how might we work smarter and um, provide uh, the right supports to do so. Um, heard and have seen concerns about student engagement and concerns about student behavior and consequences. Uh, and I, uh, I think they're linked to instruction. I think they're linked to the purpose of why we uh, respond to behaviors is to um, educate children uh, in order to change. In terms of the curriculum, uh, as you know, there ha has been a purchase of uh, software, Atlas Rubicon, so we have an opportunity for more documentation. Uh, this will um, help make curriculum more predictable, make it more transparent. There's an increased um, level of interest in what schools are teaching and questions from families about the curriculum, um, but it would also help people um, vertically understand what's happening above and below, uh, as well as horizontally. And I heard from teachers K-3 to that they really wanna work more across buildings. Um, key focus areas, we can't do everything all at once. Um, so I would suggest having uh, something of a predictable curriculum review cycle. So we spread it around and we kind of know what's coming. Um, there's budget, budget reasons for that. There's professional development reasons for that. There's also capacity reasons for that. And so literacy and math um, are on the horizon. Um, 
you know, continuing to make sure that we're investing well in social emotional learning and providing the right types of interventions around behavior. Uh, English language development um, should, you know, come as no surprise uh, that there's more uh, work to be done there in terms of curriculum, um, special education, making sure that we have a strong continuum of services for students is a huge challenge, um, not just for us within the district, but also I think in the field of special education, um, especially with staffing. Um, <clears throat> making sure we're including multiple perspectives is something that I heard from students and something that I heard from families as well as teachers. Um, we talked about it a little bit tonight, Black History Month, making sure that multiple perspectives and diverse representation is within the curriculum. Um, and one, um, one parent in particular spoke very eloquently about uh, that as a vehicle to children feeling like they belong. And uh, attending to students' mental and physical health uh, is also an opportunity and area of focus in this, in this realm. Uh, the third opportunity, again, um, I feel like I'm reading some of your questions to me back <laughs> to you tonight, but this is the sense that I've made of them, which is around, um, you know, what does it mean to grow your own? Uh, and I think there is a real need for talent development. Um, we have some significant staffing challenges, although I think we're faring better than perhaps I expected, um, but I can see the trends. Um, we've got a high cost of living and, and uh, not enough housing. Um, we have a goal, uh, a worthy goal of diversifying our educator workforce because of its positive impact on students. And we have some very hard to fill positions, including ones that are highly specialized roles, uh, as well as um, really critical support positions like bus driver, repair professionals, and substitute teachers. Um, traditional recruitment and ret retention efforts are not as effective as they used to be. Um, you've gotten more creative with bonuses, um, for example, um, but I think we need to uh, have a concerted effort to do more. Um, we've been talking a lot about developing career ladders and providing incentives. My understanding um, in talking with the union is that there may have been uh, some of this in the past, um, putting a very intentional focus on attention. I know our data supports, um, supports that we have good retention, but we wanna make sure it stays that way. Um, and we want to make sure it stays that way, especially for educators from diverse backgrounds um, who maybe some, you know, kind of both here and then kind of in the field don't always feel like they fully belong. Unengaged in additional outreach. Um, <clears throat> I think the op opportunity to grow from within um, will require a specific uh, and concerted focus on PD um, with human resources implications. And then um, we also, I think, have an opportunity to develop a strong PD plan for staff, um, which takes a little bit to the idea of a vision of an educator. What do our educators need to support um, the vision we have for students? And then um, the last area, um, again, I don't think this will come as a surprise, um, is around facilities, enrollment, and future planning. Uh, so spending a lot of time um, looking at our buildings as a, as a really important resource. Um, we have a portfolio of aging school buildings. I think Mike and his team do a tremendous job uh, at maintenance, uh, but our oldest school, um, BCIS, is, was built in the 40s, and I think we have a couple that were built in the 50s. Um, we have a significant list of capital improvement projects with additional ones to be planning for. Um, we are looking at enrollment trends um, with long-term seeing an overall decrease, but We've stabilized, and you'll see some tonight in the budget presentation, and we're also showing some signs of growth at the elementary schools. We're using our space differently, too. We've got more specialized programs. We have more specialized services, and that requires us to rethink how space gets used. Um, I already talked about concerns that were presented about two, two grade schools, um, and I feel um, that I need to kind of convey that there were members uh, in the community expressing concerns about grade eight at the high school. Um, we have uh, space constraints at many schools, as you know, which has brought up concerns about equity um, as well as adequacy. And um, we're anticipating the three-year lease of portables at two of our sites to be coming this summer, um, but other needs are emerging. Um, so it's an opportunity. I don't quite know um, what the um, what the ultimate sort of status will be is we're awaiting two reports, one a facilities conditions assessment and one uh, an enrollment forecast, which should give us a picture over the next decade uh, of what we might expect for student enrollment. Um, but that is another kind of big area. Um, and that's not to say that other things didn't come up. Plenty, plenty of stuff came up, including, for example, public comment with um, the question about seven periods um, for students at the high school. Um, but I purposefully looked really big picture, really long term from the seat of superintendent and the entire system. Um, those other matters, um, you know, didn't necessarily make it here, but I did hear lots and lots of other details um, that, uh, and, and, and I've taken a lot in. 
Um, so in terms of next steps, um, I'm seeking input from you and feedback um, from you, as well as um, we'll be sharing it with um, community stakeholders. Going to be talking about this with um, faculty and staff at next week's Professional Development Day, although I did share the presentation with them earlier this evening mm -hmm. um, with the idea that we, um, once once I get the feedback and sort of codify this into um, some, some final strengths and opportunities, work with you and the leadership team, uh, as well as um, other community members to develop some long-term goals. So we'd be happy to take any questions or hear your comments uh, tonight or input and feedback in the weeks to come. Okay, excellent. Anybody have any questions? What do you wanna? Go ahead, Joe. Go ahead. I would say, I, uh, very thorough. <laughs> So I noticed you didn't put any graphs up there, so I'm just going to stop. Chris, Kristen must have told you not to give you a warning, <laughs> not to put anything up there. But no, it was, it was a great job. Yeah. And I'm glad you. to have you. Keep up the great work. Thanks. Thank you. If you wanted any data, I mean, there are graphs behind some of this. I just kept it, kept it <laughs> high that, level. That was your copy, Joe, level. had the graphs. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, just for me, uh, add on to what Joe said, you know, in terms of um, the breadth of information, looking uh, as the superintendent uh, from your chair, uh, at the macro lens, um, you know, but as we uh, are having the conversations, you've noted uh, certain priority areas. You know, I think uh, that the the empirical uh, weight, the amount of information that you've included in here, uh, can be a foundation for the discussions that we're, we're we're going to be having. So that you know, when we're talking about these different issues, whatever the priority that is brought before us, um, you know, we, we can we can discuss it. Uh, from an empirical lens, I know that uh, when things happen, um, you know, we, we respond sometimes, you know, uh, you know, very, uh, sometimes our response, you know, can be in the moment, you know, in terms of what's happening. Again, you noted uh, trauma-informed uh, levels of stress, and so that impacts how we respond to a situation. But in order to get it right, you have to take a step back and, and look at the overall lens and, and the data that we have, you know, to make uh, the right decision, okay, rather than the split decision. Um, and so, again, to Joe's point, you know, very thorough, uh, a year uh, of work, uh, of gathered data, dat, of ga data gathering, excuse me, <laughs> data <that>. gathering. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, I just feel like now, uh, this is not just something that you did for a report because it's scheduled in the agenda and you have to do it as a part of your role, uh, but this can be leaned on and relied upon uh, when we're making informed decisions uh, that we want to be effective in the moment and going forward. Peter, Peter you got anything or are you all set? All set, thanks. Okay, all set. Okay, Kathy? And for the most part, I'm all set. I, I do agree it was very thorough, and I you don't look exhausted, so <laughs> but you have to be exhausted with all those meetings because I know there were a lot more meetings than what you even noted for this evening. Um, when you were going through the interview process, I had found the um, profile of a graduate, and I was I had meant to bring it up to you and never had the chance. And so I was glad to see that you would like to incorporate that and develop one for Barnstable. That was one of the pieces that I found was unique about you that you didn't bring to the table during your interviews. And I think the community will appreciate that as well as the students because I think it instills the purpose of why we're here K to 12 and then some beyond age 22. So I look forward to that profile of a graduate. Excellent work. Thank you. Excellent work. I, I kind of know a little bit of how much work you've done on this just because we kind of were talking as you were going through it, but um, the amount of hours you've put in just shows you how much you care and how you do want to make a difference. And I, you kind of look at this as like the footprint of the beginning and, and like Andre said, this is just this isn't just a report. I can guarantee you that that our superintendent, this is her kind of taking it now and putting the rubber with her to the road. Um, this is what she's gonna use as kind of a, a good chunk of your guiding principles. Um, and I also think it's kind of it's always good to have somebody come from the outside and kind of take stock of where you're, where the whatever, whether it's a school department or a fire department or whatever the case may be, because you kind of have a different lens of looking at it from the outside. So, I mean, you're gonna find 
things that are working. You have to find things that aren't working and like how you're bringing in a different knowledge of how you can fix those things. Cause you kind of get, this is the way we do it in Barnstable and you kind of bring in a different lens to that. So that's, that's phenomenal, but excellent work. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Um, so anything else, anybody else, nothing? No, no? it was just very thorough. I, I didn't mean to skip no, me. Okay. I was very impressed, very impressed. Well, like Kathy said, the amount, she kind of didn't even come close to put down the amount of meetings she had and the amount of people she met with. Um, I know for a fact that there was way, they would, we'd be here for another hour if she talked about all the people she really actually met with. So honestly, awesome job. Um, and very, like, and one of the things that she told me about that she found really neat about Barnstable is, and I kind of started thinking about it, is how much community support we have. Like, it's just, it's like a, it's big, but it's still like that small town atmosphere. And she was like, yeah, one of the things is just how many, how many people truly, it takes a village to raise kids and like we truly bring that to life. And it's, I kind of started to, like, she was telling me some of the things and I'm like, oh yeah, like I kind of, it's just the way Barstable does it, you know what I mean? And, but for her, it was like, wow, that's really cool. So to hear it from her, it was kind of neat when she started going through it with me. So thank you. And uh, we will, if anybody has any questions or comments, just reach out to Sarah over the next couple of weeks and yep. um, we'll keep, she'll get going. So now we're going to.